Hi guys, last week I made this uh, CPU interface for my floppy disk controller and I connected it up to the floppy disk drive and had the 6502 moving the drive heads around and it's a very simple interface just consisting of a decoder and one read register and one write register connected straight through to some of the control lines on the floppy disk drive and this allowed the 6502 to control the position of the head on the disk drive and tell when it's on track zero and things like that. What I want to do today is extend this interface to allow it to read data from the floppy disk drive. So with the groundwork laid last week, uh, this is fairly simple. I should be able to just add two more transceivers, just like the existing one we used to read the control lines from the disk drive, and connect these through to the read clock and read data lines from my floppy disk controller circuit. The chip enables on these two ICs need to be connected to new pins on the 74HC138 decoder and that will allow the CPU to read from two new addresses to read the clock and data lines from the floppy disk controller. Note also the byte line that's connected to A3 on U7 up here. The floppy disk controller drives that signal high for 4 microseconds every time it reads a byte from the floppy disk and that kind of indicates to the CPU that it's able to read the clock and data lines corresponding to that byte. That's only high for 4 microseconds and if you read from the clock and data lines outside of that window you, will, you actually won't get good data. I could leave it like this because my CPU is running at 6 MHz or so and so 4 microseconds is 24 CPU cycles which is plenty of time to read both registers. However, I can also swap these transceivers out for uh, 74HC374D flip-flops. Uh, these are a bit like the output register, but they're going to be used on the input side. They have tri-state output, so they can connect straight to the CPU's data bus. And what this will mean is I can connect the byte signal to the clock pins on these uh, D flip-flops. And that means that they will snapshot the state of the outputs from the shift register in my floppy disk controller at exactly the right time. And they will then hold that data for the next 64 microseconds until the next byte is read. And that will give the CPU a much larger window to read the data in. So I might as well do this instead of using the transceivers. I'll probably actually use 74HC574 D flip-flops instead of 374s, but I put 374s on the diagram here because that's what KaiKed has the symbol for. The only real difference is the order of the pins, which is a little bit more sane on the 574s. So let's go and make these changes on the breadboard and get this circuit connected up to my old floppy disk controller circuit. So here's the circuit I built last time, let's put that down there. Just going through the parts uh, to compare against the circuit diagram. Over here we have the uh, 74HC138 decoder that uh, determines which part of the circuit the CPU wants to talk to. Um, in the center here we have the uh, read transceiver which is being used to read various data lines from the disk, things like whether it's on track zero. And over here we have the D flip-flop that's controlling the MOSFETs that drive various signals that go to the drive such as causing it to step and things like that. Now if you remember last time I left a big gap here because I knew I was going to want to put some read circuit in here uh, at a later date and that time has come now so that's where we're going to put the new D flip-flops. Um, I've got them here, these are 74HC574s which are 8-bit D flip-flops, kind of like this one but they have tri-state outputs and uh, all, their, all their inputs are on, in line along the bottom and all the outputs are in line along the top so they're a little bit easier to deal with than this one where the inputs and outputs are all mixed up. So these go in that gap in the middle, let's take that wire off for now, put it back later. There should be enough space because I measured it out using one of these uh, and, they're, and they're the same number of pins. I'm just going to leave that there for a moment and make sure it's in the right place. Yep, yeah, they just fit with a, with a little gap between them. I'm just going to pop them in. Um, so those need power and ground as usual, and they have the power and ground pins in the corner. Now the inputs are along the bottom, and those are going to come from the floppy disk controller circuit that I made um, last year. On the top are the outputs, and that's where the CPU data bus goes. And the CPU data bus is also what's being carried by these grey wires over here. So I'm going to use white wires for this, um, and I think it's the left hand pins. That's the CPU data bus joined together uh, on the on the output sides of these uh, tri-stated D flip-flops. That also needs to join to these grey lines. Which bits am I going to use as which? I think I think these were in I think the low order bit was at this end, 
of, of these. I might have to change the code if I get this wrong. So I'm going to join that to the far side of this chip to make it consistent. So now the CPU data bus is joined between all of these chips, uh, the three read chips and the, and the one write chip there. So the other pin on the top side of these chips at the far side uh, is, I believe, the clock pin. And I want them to clock at the same time as each other, so I'm going to join that together as well uh, with a yellow wire. And if you remember, this is going to be driven by the uh, byte signal coming from the floppy disk controller circuit. Next we have the bottom row and the bottom row mostly connect through to the floppy disk controller. Um, I'm going to connect this one maybe to the clock pins and this one to the data pins uh, from the shift registers. The remaining pin on this side, on the left hand side here, pin 1, is the output enable pin and these don't get connected together um, because the CPU is only going to read from one of these at a time. The output enable pins connect through to the uh, decoder in much the same way as this uh, IC's output enable pin here connected to the decoder. Remember the high four pins on the decoder are for read operations and this is a read operation. I'm going to connect output 7 to this one here and then I can connect output 6 which is I'm going to connect that one to the other chips output enable on this side here. So that means the CPU can independently read from these two chips now. This needs to be connected up again. It was connected to output 4. I'm actually going to connect it to output 5, I think, because I'd quite like I'd quite like the address for reading from this register to be different to the address for writing to this register. So last time around I had them both connected to the same address, but one for reads and one for writes. I'm just going to make them different. I think it'll be a bit clearer and I might I might need to take advantage of that in the code in a, in a future video. That's most of the static kind of wiring done there. The next step is to connect it up to the uh, floppy disk controller circuit. And I was originally going to connect them with the floppy disk controller at the top, but I think it makes more sense to do it with the floppy disk controller at the bottom simply because all of the outputs of these shift registers, although they're on the bottom side of this circuit, they connect to the bottom side of that circuit, and I think it's going to be less messy if I do it this way around. So I'm going to join these two boards together. So they have common power now. So I need to connect all of the pins up here to alternating pins down here and all the pins here to the other alternating pins down here. Now the first bit to get into the shift register is actually the high bit of the byte and by the time we read the byte that bit would have shifted all the way along to the far end. So I need to connect the right hand side of the shift register to the left hand side of these ICs, that being the high byte given the way I've uh, arranged these. Maybe I should have done those differently. It's a bit too late for that now though. Um, also, the first bit that comes in is a clock bit. Um, it doesn't really matter very much which one's which, but um, it's worth bearing in mind. Maybe, I think I connected this IC to output 7 over here and this one to output 6. So perhaps I want output 6 to be the clock bits and output 7 to be the data bits. So this will be the high bit of the clock byte. And I said I wanted the clock on this IC, I believe. So that one goes over to here. I'm just going to skip one and then take the next pin from here to the next pin up there. If you remember when I had the Arduino plugged in, I also had to crisscross all the wires. There we go, that's not very neat and tidy, but it'll do the trick. This is all just prototyping, of course, as pretty much everything I do is just prototyping. So this is the uh, low bit of the data byte, which has to go all the way over to that side there. So again, just taking alternating pins from the shift register to sequential pins on the D flip-flop. So that's all the clock and data lines connected from the uh, shift registers down here to the D flip-flops up here, ready to pass data to the CPU. Now the clock pin on the D flip-flops needs to be connected to the byte indicator from the floppy disk controller, which I believe is pin 15 of that timer I see. I'll check it later, but I think that's the one. And that's the terminal count pin. 
it should go high for one clock cycle of that timer which is one bit length from the floppy disk uh, just at the right time for the CPU to be able to read the bytes um, and what I want to do is rather than have the CPU do it at exactly that moment I want to tell these D flip flops to remember that remember that data for it so that'll do that and I think the only thing remaining now is to actually wire this up to the floppy disk drive and to the homebrew computer. So the homebrew computer wire up is the data bus needs to be wired in here. Um, some of the address lines get wired into the uh, decoder over here. Uh, the read write line gets wired in there as well. And I think the reset line got hooked up over here too. Now that's that side of things. For the uh, floppy disk drive all the, all the signals that go to the floppy disk drive get wired into these MOSFETs and the signals that come from the floppy disk drive get wired in here for the ones that the CPU reads directly and I think there were some connections down here for the others like the read data line came in here um, I can't remember whether any others came in here as well but we'll have to we'll have to see I'll probably check my old video to see what I what I actually wired up there because it's very easy to forget but before wiring all that up, let's go and write the code that will drive this. So here's the updated code. Actually, I've split the file uh, off into a separate test program. I kept the old one kicking about in case I want to go back to it at some point. There's only a couple of changes I've made to some of these definitions at the top here. I moved the index one because it was in not the best of places. Um, and I've added this byte one here because uh, remember, we've got this byte signal that we want to be able to read as well now. Down here, the status register has now moved to have a 1 on it. Um, this is because I've, I've, I've changed the way that's wired in the circuit so that it's actually not on the same address as the control register now. And we've got these clock and data uh, registers are now accessible to the CPU at 4002 and 4003. Um, otherwise, the program is quite different now. I've deleted all the old test code. Um, and what I've done is I have... Uh, written a routine to seek to a track and a routine to read some bytes from the disk. So what this does at the moment is it waits for a button, it turns the motor on just like before, it seeks to track zero straight away and that's important because otherwise its track uh, register in zero page won't have the correct number in it. The only way it knows which track the head is actually on is by telling it to go to track zero first. And then we execute a seek test and that just seeks to random tracks, I'll show you the code for that in a second. Uh, then I'm telling it to seek to track 10. This FDC seek is a function I've created uh, that looks at the track number in the accumulator and tells the disk to go to that track. And then I've just made it execute this read test repeatedly uh, and wait for buttons in between. So we should probably have a look at the seek test first. Uh, the seek test just loads 0 into the accumulator and tells it to seek to that. Uh, then loads 79 and tells it to seek to that. These are 80 track drives and disks, so that's the last track on the disk nominally. Then it goes to track 24, then track 62, then track 1, and then finally track 0. And I put track 1 in here because if it reached track 0 when it was trying to get to track 1, that would kind of indicate that maybe it's got out of sync. And I kind of thought that putting this here would help me tell that it's actually staying in sync. I'm not convinced it really is a useful test because it's pretty much impossible to tell whether it works or not. But anyway, that's how that's what that does. Um, it ends by seeking back to track zero again. Then we have read test. So read test is uh, fairly simple in, in principle. I'm defining some local variables here. ZP index is a location in zero page where I can store an index temporarily. Um, buffer is just a block of memory I can read the data into uh, because I can't afford to print the data out while I'm reading it from the disk. You have to read quite quickly to get the bytes off the disk and it can't wait for you if, you're, if your CPU is being slow. So it's quite important that I don't try and do some kind of character output to the screen in this loop. It's, it's, it's just going to miss bytes if I do that. So I have to have this buffer and store all the data there. Count is 11 here. That's, that's how many bytes I'm going to read from the disk at a time. And we start by zeroing the index, then there's a loop here, uh, reading bytes from the disk until we find one with the clock set to C7. So the read byte function I'll show you in a moment as well. That one uh, leaves the data portion of the byte in the accumulator and the clock portion in, in the X register. So this is just waiting for the clock to be C7, and C7 is the magic signature for address marks on, on with the FM encoding. So we just keep going until we find that. 
Um, once we've found that, we grab the index into the Y register and use that to index into the buffer. Um, and we're going to store A with this kind of offset count plus one, uh, just so that the data bytes are stored after the clock bytes. So we can store all the clock bytes first, then all the data bytes. So that's the first data byte getting stored there. Then we transfer X to A and store the corresponding clock byte at the start of the buffer. Increase Y and store it back in this zero page location. I used the zero page location because I wasn't sure whether some of my functions were going to corrupt the Y, y register. So I thought, I thought I'd uh, take care with it here. Until we've got up to 11 bytes, we just keep repeating that loop. And once that's done, we display them all on the screen. So there's, there are two loops here, one to display the clock bytes and one to display the data bytes. And they just start from the beginning again, and then uh, loop over that buffer, printing them in hex, um, leaving a little gap, um, and then stopping when it's done 11 of them. And, and then it does a new line before doing the data bytes. So we're going to see the clock bytes on top and the data bytes underneath that correspond to those clock bytes. So next we have the read byte routine, which is new, it's fairly simple. All we want to do is we want to wait for the byte indicator to be low, and then we want to wait for it to go high again. So we're looking for the rising edge of that byte indicator. This this happens at the point where it's safe to read the byte from, from, from the floppy disk controller. But remember we also uh, used D flip flops to cache this byte as well. So this same rising edge will, is also what will be caching the byte in the D flip flops. The D flip flops are going to be faster than the CPU in this case, so it's, there's no real race condition here. As soon as we see this go high, then we can read the, the data from the flip flops. I'm using the bit instruction for this, which is the most efficient way to sample bits from these kinds of IO ports. So I'm loading the bit that I'm interested in into the A register. I think that's like number four or something like that. So that's just one bit set in the A register. And then I have this tiny loop here where I'm using the bit instruction on the status register. And what that will do, among other things, is it will perform an AND of the value it reads from the status register with the value I have in the A register. It won't change the A register, but it will perform the AND and then set the zero flag or clear the zero flag, depending on what the result of the AND was. So you can continually poll like this. You don't have to keep reloading the, 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 the byte or anything like that that you're going to check. Um, it's, it's, it's a fairly efficient way to check for, for, uh, for, for bits being set in, in data bytes like that. So the first loop here is waiting for it not to be set. And we're using BNE for that. And the second loop is waiting for it to be set using BEQ. So when it's set, uh, the zero flag will not be set after the bit instruction and this BEQ will then fail. And when we see that rising edge, all we do is we load the accumulator from the data register and the X register from the FTC's clock register and then return. And this then gets picked up by the test routine that I showed you above. Um, you know, it knows that the X register contains the clock and the accumulator contains the data. The only other new thing here is this seek function that I've written, um, and this is the one which takes a track in the accumulator and searches for that track on the disk. It assumes that the um, zero page location that I'm storing the current track in is correct, so it will perform a seek relative to that. And I've put some debugging stuff in here to make it print messages on the screen as well, just to help uh, tell what's going on. Um, and there's lots of pushing and pulling because I need to make sure I don't lose this value that's in the accumulator while I'm calling all these other functions, which I'm not very careful with preserving registers in my functions. So I never forget, I never remember which ones do or don't preserve any registers. Anyway, if the track was zero, then it's very easy. We just do the seek to track zero function that we wrote last time around, and that just steps outwards until the floppy drive says it's on track zero. So seeking to track zero is treated specially here. Um, we, do, we, we do this different thing, and it will always get the thing back in sync with the floppy disk drive in case it's gone out of sync. Otherwise, there's this loop, and it just keeps looping until it's on the right track. Um, I'm showing the floppy disk controller status just for debugging purposes, and that means we get a kind of running total of which track it thinks it's on while it's doing the seek. I'm comparing the value in the accumulator, which is the track we want to get to, with its notion of which track it's currently on, and if the value in the accumulator was less than the current track, then we jump to this seek step out routine. Otherwise, if it was not equal, then we jump to the step in routine. If it was equal, then we're done. So we just uh, print a new line and return. And stepping in is very simple. I'm going to save the A register while we call the step in function um, and then jump back to the loop up here 
to see whether we've got to the right track yet. And step out is exactly the same, except it does the JSR to step out instead of to step in. So I think that's it for code changes. Let's uh, get that compiled, get it onto the EPROM and see how it runs in the circuit. So I've hooked the circuit up now to the 6502 computer and also to the floppy disk drive. So I made a mistake earlier on. Um, it turns out that the way I set the circuit up before, the low bit was on the left hand side, not the right hand side of these uh, existing uh, registers here. So I have swapped everything around. So all of these lines that we put in earlier on are now no longer crisscrossed. Um, that's about it for that. The uh, This is the data bus coming in from the CPU here. Uh, black is, uh, as in the resistor color code, the black is the bit zero and purple is bit seven. Um, so that's all connected up to the transceivers, sorry, to the to the D flip flops there. Uh, over here, the yellow and orange wires come from address bits zero and one from the CPU. So those are going into the selection bits on the D flip flop, sorry, the selection bits on the decoder. Um, and the brown, red, orange, and yellow are going into the other uh, selection bits, uh, just like they were last time. The reset line is also still connected back into where it was before. You probably can't see that very well because of the floppy disk thing in the way. So the floppy disk uh, hookup itself is just as before. The black is the ground. That's going straight in there. This orange line here, I believe, is the index hole selection. I'm not really using that, but I've wired it through to one of the bits on the uh, read status register. Uh, the yellow line here and the white line are the uh, motor on and drive select lines. Those go to the MOSFETs. Uh, then we've got uh, grey and purple, I think, are to do with the stepping and direction. Um, blue and green, I think, are for writing data. I've just I've not connected them to anything. Um, yellow is track zero indication. That's going to the status register. Orange is probably write protect, or it might have been side select. I can't remember, but it's, it's a read signal, and it's going over to that register as well, not using it at the moment. And red is the read data line, which is now going into the same place it was before on the floppy disk controller circuit down here. Um, I can't really show you what's underneath that, unfortunately, because it's a bit tight, and these ribbon cables are quite hard to manoeuvre, so I'll have to leave it at that. But the, the circuit underneath is unchanged from, from the previous videos. So let's fire it up and see that code in action. Plug it in and turn it on. So the screen's gone red there. I think if I push the push the button it should turn the drive on. As you can see that's turned on over there. And that's what it has to say on the screen. So if I push the button once I think it will do the seek test. That's just seeking to various tracks that I picked off the top of my head. Just going backwards and forwards and making sure it gets there okay. Um, the last one seek to track one and then finally to track zero and that was sort of to make sure it didn't lose lose track of a track on the way or something like that. Not really a thorough test but it seems to work well and that shows that my sort of seek to track routine is doing a good job. If I push the button again we should read a field off the disk. So there we go, That's, that looks like valid data to me. So the top line it's printed out here is the clock bytes and the bottom line is the data bytes. So C7 is the magic code in the clock byte that indicates the start of a field on the disk and FE means this is an ID field. The rest of these should always be FF because they should really be FF for all valid bytes apart from the, the address marks at the start of fields. So an ID field consists of four bytes of data. We have A, 0, 9 and 1 and then a two byte CRC which is 2, 3 and E0. After that uh, I think you're required to write a certain number of FFs to the disk. Actually I thought, were, I thought you were supposed to write a 0 but maybe that's not the case. Um, anyway the, the remaining bytes here are just kind of what's, what, what's after the ID field on the disk so usually you, you write a little bit of a sort of run out before you turn off the, the arrays and write heads. So what these fields mean is A is the track number which is track 10 and as you can see I did a seek to track A so that's all correct. Zero indicates which side of the disk we're looking at and uh, I haven't set the side to select one signal so this is side zero so that makes sense as well it's often actually not filled in depending on how strict the format of the disk was nine is the sector number so this is sector nine around the disk and these bbc micro format discs tend to have 10 sectors around the track it's numbered from zero to nine 
and one refers to the size of the sector on the disk. So zero means 128 bytes, one means 256 bytes, and two means 512 bytes, and so on. It just keeps doubling after that. When I did the Arduino hookup, I did uh, check the CRC codes were matched uh, when I was sort of verifying the general functionality of this circuit. I haven't implemented that for the 6502 version yet, but, but we'll probably do that in another video. Let's grab some more fields and see what see what they look like. That's another sector ID. So it's FE for the sector ID. A is the track number again. Zero is the head number. Four is the sector number. So this is a different one to before. And the CRC is obviously changed as well. Well, that's different. That's a, that's a data sector. So we have uh, FB as the field type this time, which means data rather than the ID fields that we saw before. And this one seems to consist of mostly zeros. Then it goes AT, zero, zero. So the, yeah, there's a there's some data there. I'm not sure what it is. I have no idea what was on this disk before I started experimenting with it. Could have been a game or something or some data files. Who knows? Let's get another one. So that's another another sector ID field. Um, this is for sector three. Another sector ID field for sector zero. And yeah, I can I can just keep pulling these off. We're much more likely to see sector IDs here rather than uh, rather than data fields, and that's because the uh, sector IDs are actually really small on the disk. So the chance of you seeing a data field requires you to actually uh, start searching for a field while the disk head is in the middle of a sector ID or in the gap between a sector ID and a data field. Most of the disk is taken up with data, so you're much more likely to be in the middle of a data block already when you start looking for a field like this. Um, so yeah, you're far more likely to see a, an ID field next rather than a data field. But yeah, that's working really well. I think some things I could do next would be um, more sort of higher level functions to specifically look for ID fields versus data fields, uh, to find sectors on the track and to, load a, and, to, and to load a sector of data into memory. But I'm going to leave those for another video. So let's turn the disk drive off, give it a break. And uh, yeah, I hope this has been interesting. It's gone pretty well. I think there were a couple of mistakes along the way, but they're pretty easily corrected. I made a ton of mistakes with the code. But that always happens, you just have to debug that and fix it. And I suspect next time we're going to be actually reading some data off the disk. I'll have to put some decent data onto the disk first, I guess. Maybe use a BBC Micro for that. And then we can see if we can read it off onto the, onto the homebrew computer. As always, uh, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this. Um, leave me some comments down below if you've got any feedback. And yeah, let me know if there's anything you'd like to see me do with this in future. Have a great day.